All right, let's get started. Gather around and come close. We got a great panel tonight. Okay, gather around the front. We're going to get started. We got a great panel tonight. New York, thank you for showing up tonight. And on behalf of Duchy, I'd like to thank the Cannabis Association of New York. Thank you so much for putting on such an amazing event. Let's give a big round of applause for them. If you are not a member yet, I highly recommend that you join. That is my membership plug. Um, that's for Dan Livingston, who's probably listening out there somewhere. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Anne. I'm with Duchy. We provide compliant dispensary software. You can come check us out over there if you'd like. Um, we are super grateful and excited to be co-hosting such an incredible event. As you can see behind me, we've got an incredible group of panelists. Um, we've got some card applicants. We've got Eli from the Bronx Defenders. We've got our very own director of GR, Erica Woods. She's in her lift ride right now. She's two minutes away, but we're going to get started. Um, but first, I would like to introduce you to your main host and moderator for this evening. She is also co-chair of the NYC committee at Canny. Uh, please put your hands together for Vanessa. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, and thank you so much for coming out. Um, I know this is like a really important time to keep networking, keep growing your business, starting your business. Um, I think it's it's excellent, you know, just for you know Canny to to be a part of it as a resource. It's it's a really good organization. I joined like not knowing anything about cannabis, honestly, and um, you know I became the chair and really working on white papers and policy, and it's been really good um, for me to build my business and grow my business, start my business. So I appreciate everything they've done for me. Um, Nicole, do you want to come up and say a few words? She's also my co-chair. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, thank you, Duchy, for having this uh, event and hosting it for us. Thank you, Anne. Thank you to the Duchy staff. Thank you all for coming out. Um, you know, I'm gonna just say, if you don't get 20 contacts, you shouldn't have came, you know? I mean, that's, you know, what it is. This is what we are about, education, outreach, and network, and I'm just happy everyone is here. If you guys don't know about the mentorship program, it's here, you know? Um, it's free, you know, 15 hours. You, you know, you have the opportunity to know everything that you need to know if you wanna open up a processing facility or be a cultivator. You know, this is, no state has done it like we're doing it, you know, and it's the opportunity where we have to take advantage of it, you know what I mean? If you want to get in this business, they have a lot of opportunities here in New York State, and we have to take advantage. If you're not a member of Candy, I strongly suggest you join. $500 a year. We eat that in the restaurant. Okay? I love you guys. Thank you for coming out, you know, and I'm going to pass it on to Omari. Oh, Vanessa, I'm sorry. All right, we're just going to do a brief introduction. So we're just going to pass the microphone to everybody here on the panel just to introduce, um, say your name and where you're from and, you know, your industry, whatever your background is, just short, and then we'll go into further detail um, when we start doing the Q&A. All right? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Omari Lee. I'm from Queens, New York. The name of my business is NY Cannameds, located in Dumbo, Brooklyn. We help people get their uh, New York State medical marijuana card. We also do chronic care management. And I'm right now, I'm a card applicant to get the dispensary uh, license here in New York State. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name's Eli Northrup. I'm, I'm not a card applicant. I'm, I'm actually a public defender. Uh, in the Bronx. I work for an organization called the Bronx Defenders. Um, but uh, I also do policy work. You know, in the, when I first started representing people in the Bronx, the number one charge that I saw was possession of marijuana. So very evident how disproportionate the policing was in, in New York State. And it led me into policy work and really fighting for marijuana justice and the MRTA and 
that kind of led to making sure that the social equity provisions of the bill, you could pass a bill, but if you don't actually give people support and see it through, then it's really meaningless to just have words on a page. So we launched the Bronx Cannabis Hub to help people, people who had been arrested and targeted for arrest, uh, participate in the industry. So we just got through helping uh, 30 people submit card applications, and I'll, I'll be here to talk about that experience, I guess. Nice to be here. Thank you. Um, my name is Hiram Hernandez. Um, I'm from upstate New York, Rochester, New York, to be specific. Um, I am the president of Good Life Collective. Uh, we have a retail dispensary in Astoria, Oregon. We're looking to take our brand over to uh, the Finger Lakes uh, area specifically. And um, I am a card applicant as well. Hello, everyone. I'm Brittany. This is my husband, Jason. We're the owners of Flower City Hydroponics in upstate New York, also Rochester. Kind of crazy running into you here. <laughs> Rochester, Rochester in the building. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, we actually sell indoor and outdoor gardening equipment and supplies, so mainly cannabis, cannabis farmers. And uh, we're located in Fairport, New York. We're card applicants. We both have cannabis convictions. And we hope to, you know, plant roots in uh, the Finger Lakes region as well. <laughs> There's nine of them. <laughs> There's nine of them. And uh, we are a woman minority owned business. <laughs> uh, my name is Klaus Marte. I'm the co-founder of ComBud. Uh, what we do is going to be hiring people that have been convicted for the uh, marijuana convictions. And I also own a, a current business that hires people coming out of the prison system. I've been able to hire over 50 people coming out of the system and have a zero recidivism rate at my current gym right now called Con Body. So you get the point, Con Body, Con Bud. So I'm, I could fuck you up and then recover you with weed. So <laughs> that's, 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 my, that's my pitch. And um, you know, I look forward to the event. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, so we have so, a few questions that we curated, so I'm just going to go through, um, jump back and forth between people, um, just to share their stories and the process that they did going through the card application. Um, let's start with Eli. So the Bronx Star for Defenders helped write ha um, about how many card applicants did you guys do? 30. 30? Okay. And um, that's, that's quite a lot, <laughs> so I'm sure you're familiar with everything. Um, so for those of us here who may not be as familiar with the qualifications to be eligible for a card applicant, can you let us know what card stands for and what the qualifications are? Well, Mike. Um, yeah, so card stands for Conditional Adult Use Retail Dispensary License. And this is the first uh, dispensary licenses that are available in New York State. And But they have these very narrow qualifications. So you need, you need to meet really three criteria. A significant presence in New York, which was really you lived there or you had a business there, even a bank account. But then you also had to have a cannabis-related conviction. This was initially defined as a misdemeanor or a felony conviction for cannabis. OCM eventually expanded that definition slightly. Um, if you were arrested for cannabis and you were convicted of any crime or even a violation, that counted. So unfortunately, that left out a number of people who uh, got what's called an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal, which is a very common result in cannabis cases. Um, but it did include people that were arrested for cannabis and convicted for some other charge or for something like a disorderly conduct. You want to introduce we got a new panelist. Let's let her introduce herself. Sorry, fresh off a plane from Washington, D.C., where a lot of exciting things have happened today. So, <laughs> Erica Woods, I'm the Director of Government Relations for Duchy. Sorry to be tardy, but happy to answer any government-related questions um, related to New York. We're excited to be here. And then one last question for Eli. Um, if you were convicted in another state, does that qualify? Yeah, convictions in another state did not qualify. The conviction had to be in New York, and uh, you also had to demonstrate where you were living at the time of the conviction. The, sec the other, the final criteria was you had to show two years of profitable business experience, so mainly through tax returns. Those two years didn't have to be consecutive, um, but they did have to be at least two years of profits. So it was a narrow group that, that ultimately was eligible, uh, but it turned out 
903 people applied in the end, so um, there were enough. It's definitely so going in the middle. In the beginning, I think it was like a slow, we were like five people, 10 people, that's it. So I definitely <laughs> agree that like the last minute rush. Um, so what I wanna do is just go through all the card applicants and just kind of share your story and your experience. Um, you can share as much as you want to, as much as you're comfortable with. Um, just share your background and how it came to be that you're a card applicant. You wanna start? Hello again, uh, my name is Omari Lee. Um, I am a card applicant. My first uh, marijuana conviction was uh, March 17, 2009. I got arrested not too far from here in Queens, in Woodside. Um, I got into the cannabis industry in 2017, helping people get their medical marijuana card. Um, so far, we've registered over 1,100 people in New York State um, to get medical marijuana products from the, from the dispensaries legally. And uh, we also do like chronic care management, so if people need uh, you know, wheelchairs or any type of medical assistance that's provided through insurance, we can help them with that through their like primary care physician or one of ours in our network. And uh, we also sell a lot of CBD products. Some of the CBD products, well, one of the CBD products that we sell uh, in some of the bags here today is one of the CBD creams that we have. You can try it out if you like it and uh, you can check it out on our site. Um, so yeah, I've been in cannabis for about five years now. Um, I love it. Um, I wanted to do uh, to be a card applicant because I see it as a, a good play and a good thing uh, for my family later on in the future uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the future of cannabis in New York State. You know? Um, why don't we go to Cox, because I know he has a time crunch, so. No, I appreciate you. Um, yeah, I was also a card applicant, uh, card number, applicant number thir 13. Uh, so I was like refreshing, you know, all night, you know, until, until the portal opened at 758. Um, so I was excited to be one of the first ones. And yeah, I, I, got, I was convicted for marijuana uh, multiple times. I was arrested a total of nine times. The first conviction that I had was uh, when I was 13 years old in 1998. I was stopped by cops. I got caught with a couple nickel bags and that led me through a whole system of 17 years on uh, probation, parole, prison, jail. Uh, so it was, a, it was a difficult process to get out of it. And, and fortunately, you know, I'm in this state right now where I feel so happy that I said guilty to that judge, you know, because there was some, some arrests that didn't qualify. I got arrested multiple times for marijuana, but if you did not plead guilty for that charge, you was not gonna get a conviction. So, you know, there was, there was times where lawyers, you know, told me, you know, don't plead guilty, just fight the case. I'm like, nah, I plead guilty, I'm gonna get like, let out the next day. So, you know, fortunate enough, I'm in this position now where the, the state is rewriting their wrongs and I'm fully taking advantage of this and let's see if we could all, you know, eat off of this. So I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was, so I was 15, just pretty much living on my own, hustling, um, you know, kind of fast forward things a bit, you know, I was 20 years old and had my first son, and I knew, you know, selling nickels and dimes, making $50 an ounce, $800 a pound wasn't gonna cut it. So for me, I had to start growing cannabis. I'm a legacy cannabis grower for over 18 years. I built my, built my whole, whole foundation of, of everything that I've done just off of the principles of life, and that's expanding and taking care of my family. I met my wife in college, I actually put myself through college, 2004, I met her. Um, you know, it, it's pretty crazy to be able to just sit up here and just, you know, soak up the energy in the room. Oh yeah, my door got busted down and I actually got convicted for growing cannabis without a license. So that qualifies me for CARD. Hi everyone, my story is a little bit different. Um, I actually grew up in the outskirts of uh, the city of Rochester, so a very rural area. So you can imagine low population and zero diversity. So as a little girl, I already knew there was something different about me. When I went to kindergarten, nobody looked like me. And as I kind of went through middle and high school, it only became more apparent that not only was I different, but that I wasn't accepted. I can remember walking out of 
math class in ninth grade and having cheek written on my locker, feeling humiliated, embarrassed. Um, it's difficult, especially in your middle school years. And so all of a sudden the cops, there was like such a target on me, such a focus. I was constantly being stopped, talked to, questioned, kind of patronized. And so one day they got me. I was 17 years old and I was about a mile away from my home and a male officer pulls me over, rips me out of my car, searches my car with zero probable cause to even have his hands on me and he found my weed. So in that moment, time kind of stopped, right? Because I knew what was going to come from that. I knew it was going to be humiliation. It was going to be my character was defined. And it was going to be shameful. My family was going to see that, you know, I got in trouble for, for cannabis. And, and at that time, it was, there was a horrible stigma. So a couple days later, I get published in the county newspaper. Oh, thank you. In the county newspaper. There's no social media at this time. So you're talking small town, no social media. Everybody read that paper. So the next day I went to school, talk with the school. The businesses in the town, they wouldn't give me a job, right? You know, when you're 17, you want to work at the gas station or the diner and bus tables. Those jobs were not allowed for me because, I don't know, I was a criminal, drug dealer, drug user. And I lost a lot of friendships because their parents wouldn't let their kids associate with me but who really knows what the real reason to that was, even though their kids were smoking weed with me, okay? And that's the truth. So I had to wait until I was old enough to kind of leave that community, and I did, and I moved to the city of Rochester and went to college. That's where I met Jason. And I educated myself. And I was around wonderful people of color, different shapes, sizes, backgrounds, and that's where I really blossomed in life. And you know, went to corporate for 10 years, couldn't stand it. Being a woman minority, hitting that glass ceiling and constantly being underrepresented and constantly having to work 100 times harder, I wasn't happy. And so I reconnected with Jason in 2011 and we fell in love and we, we talked about family and he wants to get out of the legacy cannabis market and I want to get out of corporate. So we were talking one night and we we're like, how can we enter the cannabis space legally? So in 2014, we opened Metavega Corporation. We're an indoor growing equipment supplier. And we had one product, and we drove up and down the East Coast, and we sold that product one by one and built relationships with small businesses. Today, we have multiple products that we sell throughout the country. And from there, last year, we expanded and opened up Flower City Hydroponics. It's a brick and mortar retail store that sells the indoor growing equipment because we really wanted to educate our local community on cannabis, on cultivation, on home growing, and be a resource. But just keep in mind, I am CARD, and um, I'm applying under Flower City Dispensary. Rochester's the Flower City guys, in case you didn't know. And um, we incorporated in 2020. Now, we didn't have any activity and no place of business, but Jason and I had seen what other states were doing and we kind of foreseen this coming and we spent the last two years looking at what other states were implementing and trying to prepare for this moment. We didn't know New York State was going to do CARD. We were like, cannabis convictions, profitable business, this is fate, right? This is, this is like what we should do. So with our knowledge, you know, in retail and just being in the cannabis industry for so long, you know, that really led us here. You know, we're going to focus on putting women, minorities, and those most impacted by the war on drugs first. We're at the forefront of education and workforce development. We're very active in our community, and um, that's where it starts is educating people and creating opportunities for everybody to monetize and helping each other. So that's me. I know Klaus has to go, so we're going to ask him one more question, and then we'll get back to Hiram, and then we can continue our panel. So, Klaus, what did you do to prepare for your application? Um, so I went to a lot of events like this. Uh, went to every. I was like stalking the OCM on on Twitter, Instagram, just 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 like chasing them around, and just asking a whole bunch of questions. You know, Eli was a, a, an incredible resource at the Bronx, uh, a cannabis hub, and you know, I just went left and right you know I'm, I'm from the lower east side of new york city so i was uh, it was it was a good point where i got to go across to brooklyn and did, did a, a couple events downtown a couple events in harlem in the bronx i also lived in the bronx as well 
um, but I, I took advantage of you know all the resources I to get everything that I needed for the for I over prepared myself I you know I they they were saying I basically uh, created a timely portal so I could see how long the process was going to take me. Uh, I knew they were going to do the like the liquor license type of portal, so I knew. So when I did practice, it took me like three hours. Uh, I had all my documents, TPIs, everything ready, um, and so that's what I did to prepare. You know, making sure I get those tax uh, taxes that I, I showed a net profit off, off of, making sure those convictions were the right convictions, getting getting the affidavit, getting my wife to do a TPI, getting my partners to do TPIs, getting everything in order. So I was just you know. First day, I was just really refreshing all night because I thought it was going to be at 12 at night. And uh, and once the portal opened, it, it started crashing on me a few times. And, it, and and the fucked up part of it is that once you thought you completed a page and you missed something, and then it raced the whole shit on you. And so I had to re-put everything in it. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically what I did to prepare and went and did a whole bunch of research. Pretty much re memorized the regulations. Uh, Went to farmers, so I have six LOIs upstate right now, about 40,000 pounds secure if I get this card application. Uh, have a marketing strategy, have 20 of my employees already training in Netta, Massachusetts, on, on Dutchies, uh, different software systems like that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm working this shit backwards, you know, so I'm, I'm over preparing. And, and the brand is called Combud, so if you follow, if I got a bounce, hit me up on, on IG, Combud, and what? And just to clarify, what is TPI, just to explain to everyone? Uh, a lawyer. <laughs> I'm the interpreter. <laughs> it's the true parties of interest form that uh, everybody who has any interest in the, uh, the applicant has to fill out, and their spouse has to fill it out as well. <laughs> All right, yeah. Um, so basically, my, uh, my experience with drugs dates back to the 90s. Um, I, to be quite honest, I started, uh, I, used to, I used to sell controlled substances. I used to sell uh, crack cocaine in the early 90s. And I got convicted of that crime back in 96. And I went to prison. And when I got out, I didn't want to sell cocaine no more. I wanted to, I, weed, is, even though it's illegal, you don't go to jail for that long versus, you know, cocaine. But my, the area where I was, it was still a high dominant cocaine area. So I, in my delusional mind, I was trying to sell cocaine and marijuana at the same time and end up getting caught again, went back to prison uh, on a violation. Um, and when I, was, when I came home in 2000, I was done with drugs. I didn't want nothing to do with it. I don't want, I'm not selling anything. And um, I started a payments, uh, payment processing company. And it wasn't until like 20, you know, 19, um, I went to the uh, MJ Biz Conference. And, and originally I went there just to promote payment processing because um, as Dutchie knows, you know, it's, it's illegal federally. And you kind of got to have something, um, you know, to, um, yeah, nice to meet you, brother. Yeah, for sure. For sure, yeah, for sure. So, um, so, so when, when I got to the MJ Biz, you know, my, you know, again to promote payments, um, I noticed that how corporate the industry is, and part of the registration they had a minority luncheon, and and it was extra to go to the minority luncheon. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna go to the minority luncheon, see, you know, see what it's all about, whatever. And when I got there. You know, the stories I started hearing, I'm like, damn, it kind of like took me back to back to the 90s. And I said, damn, you know, there's a lot of people that paid a big price for this, you know, uh, for cannabis. I got friends that eight years, 15 years, and they don't even qualify for card because they got caught on their way to New York, you know, so they don't even qualify. And or the other one is a federal had to be state. So they didn't even qualify. Uh, for that, but this is before I even knew about the card program. In any case, fast forward, you know, I said, you know what, man, I'm gonna look into getting into the cannabis industry. And when I got back home, uh, my son, uh, who uh, was smoking cannabis, which broke my heart originally because 
my interaction originally was very derogatory. You know, I, I couldn't function uh, when I smoked cannabis, when, when I was involved with that. So I had a very bad experience. So he broke my heart when I found out that he was smoking uh, marijuana. But he educated me on the medicinal part of it, you know, how the, the benefits, not, not, not the monetary or anything of that nature. So when I went back, I asked him, I said, listen, let's, you know, what do you think about getting into cannabis? And we did, you know, we kind of did our research and we found a store out in Astoria, Oregon. And um, we basically opened up that store uh, last year and um, it, it's, been, it's, been, it's been an amazing ride. Uh, it, now, as far as New York, you know, I, you know, the car, I, I didn't know about the car program, you know, because when they said New York is going to be legal, I'm like, man, I'm not touching that, bro. It's going to be so messy, like, bro, like, uh-uh, you know. And then when I learned about the card program, and it was like, okay, yeah, that's me. Yeah, okay. I'm like, what? I'm like, nah, we got to apply. You know what I'm saying? And here we are, and, um, you know, I'm very passionate about cannabis, uh, uh, specifically to the minorities. You know what 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 is done to communities. You know, and 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 you know, good luck to all the card applicants, man. You know what I'm saying. I hope everybody that applies can eventually, if you don't get in through the car program, get in one way or another. You know, so yeah. That's amazing. So I also want to go through what's a little different from class, like how did you guys prepare individually for the application? Just take us through your process and what you did to prepare. If you did like similar to class or you did things differently, like how did you get ready for it? Um, well, for me, I wasn't even going to uh, apply for the card application. I mean, I just really wanted to get into the, to the cannabis industry. About uh, a couple years ago, in 2017, I was uh, working at a shelter on uh, Bedford and Ocean. It's like a big shelter over there, and um, I was a supervisor there. And um, I just didn't want to work there no more, so I was at home. I was like trying to figure out a new job, and my wife called me, and she was like, they opened up a dispensary um, on Jamaica Avenue. So I was like, really? But just so happened, though, like, a month ago, a month before she told me that, I had took a course online to certify people for their medical marijuana card, but I'm not a physician. So, like, I paid the $200 to do all of this, and I couldn't certify people, so now I'm stuck. So when she told me this, I ran up to Jamaica Avenue, Slacks on, whatever, and I see a guy, and he shot me into Brownsville. But now, fast, fast forward, um, signing up so many people, the reason why I didn't want to uh, do the card application is because I felt like there was going to be so many people hands in my pot. So I was like, I don't know if I really want to do it. It's not something that I want to do. And um, as I, since I joined the, uh, the Cannabis Association of, of New York, um, I was able to look at the mock application and see what was going on. And also, outside of that, there's a, a lot of people that I know that told me um, what to look out for like two years ago. Like I may need to be working with people that's doing social justice work or asking me what am I doing for the community and things of that nature. So I started looking into brothers that were like convicted, that had uh, cannabis convictions like myself. And I, I went actually to uh, right there on uh, uh, Queens Boulevard to the courthouse and I started giving out my card and signing up people. From there I signed up like 10 people and they just started calling. So I started doing it, like just keep getting it. I'm a hustler, I'm from New York, you know, I gotta get it. So, um, but luckily, um, since cannabis has started in New York, and probably, I think like hard, maybe 2015, but like since 2017, I've been going to all of the uh, conventions, all of the like meetings, I've been like looking at every little thing, making sure that my business is right, all my forms is right. So when it came time to do the application uh, for card, I already had all my stuff in the portal. It was just like click, 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 click. Read this, read this, all right, that's done, that's done, that's done. And um, luckily, um, the ladies that I've been working with, of our Ladies of Elegance, they've been doing so much work with uh, people that's been incarcerated, um, getting them to do gardening, getting them employment in New York State. So and, um, they've been around for over 20 years. So um, uh, it's a lady that I know from our community, Miss Barbara, she's here right now. She's been working with them for a long time. And um, that's how we made that connection. But, you know, last minute, it was, it was crazy because I was trying to figure out who to uh, bring on my application. You know what I mean? Who's the right person? Who's the right fit? 
who would I trust? Uh, because I want to do something different. Uh, because most people that I see that look like me, when they get an opportunity, um, they want to just call anybody in. And that person usually messes it up, right? And uh, statistically, I don't care what nobody says. You know, you go in my neighborhood, I'm from Queens, I'm from Jamaica, Queens. I lived in Woodside. But um, at all of these neighborhoods, the Chinese restaurant owned by their family. Uh, the cleaners own family. Everything is like family owned. These buildings around us are family owned. So uh, a lot of my people don't, you know, keep that going. So I try to, like, I'm trying to change that. You get what I'm saying? Within my people. So it's different. It's hard. I know how to read, thank God. You know, I need to do the application. You know, my mind. <laughs> so it's a blessing. And, uh, but yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to be honest with you, like, to me, I, I, I didn't want to play with it. You know, I, I, to me, it's too big of a, of a, of a prize, respectfully. So I, I, went and, I went and hired an attorney uh, to help guide me through it because, you know, like, I know how to read too, brother, but I got ADD, yeah. man. You know, I, I don't got, <laughs> you know, I skimmed, even through that, when she said, I just skimmed through it, and I said, okay, I yeah, I don't want to screw it up, you know, and... And to me, you know, and I'm glad I did because it's, the, the application is so tedious. Um, and, and, and again, my, my, my qualifications date back to the 90s, you know, and we're in 2022, you know, so when I'm going to get information, they got to go to the backpack, you know, you know, to, to get my information. They can't even pull it up, you know, and um, so... You know, so, so that was my experience. You know, that, that's, that's what I did, man. I just hired an attorney, period. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a brief synopsis here. So for us, like I said, we had incorporated in 2020, and we had done a lot of our due diligence pre-legalization by looking at other states. Through those years, New York State started issuing what the laws were going to be and what things were going to become. So it kind of grew with us. The application came out, and we were just feet in the street doing our research, building our business plan, visiting farms, visiting process centers all throughout upstate New York, and really seeing what's going on here in New York, right? Meeting the farmers, meeting their families, seeing the hard work that they've put in, as well as the millions of dollars that these processing facilities are investing in hopes of dispensaries such as ourselves opening and everybody making some money. Um, you know, we built that, and then towards the end of it, we hired an attorney as well. Uh, the attorney didn't build our business plan or do every single thing for us, but they did oversee regulations and make sure that we were compliant and we were following the rules. You know, we don't want to miss something. I mean, we're human, and uh, we feel pretty confident. I mean, we do a lot of work in our community. We obtained, um, you know, letters of intent, like Koss had said. Um, making sure that, you know, we're active with our uh, Business Insight Center and New York Department of Labor and job creation. I wish we would have had an Eli. <laughs> I know you do too. Um, upstate, if we didn't have such a resource so readily available to help that process. That's why I think it's amazing what you've done and how you were able to help people because I would have used those services and instead I just had to really uh, do the hard work. Yeah, I think... Um as you can tell from the, from experiences of all of these applicants, like it, the, this wasn't an application that was that simple to fill out if you're just a lay person. Like I'm a criminal attorney and I've had trouble figuring out all this. So we brought in cannabis lawyers and pro bono attorneys to help everybody in our cohort fill this out for free, totally for free because the issue is it's a real barrier. This isn't going to work if it's only the people that have the money to pay for the attorney who get it because there's another layer of individuals who are qualified but you know may not have the means in the moment to pay for that attorney and there's exploitative attorneys out there. I mean, there's people trying to make a buck every which way. So, just trying to provide a trusted place. We're not making any money off of cannabis. We're just trying to help people and so what I hope is that in future rounds of licenses the state the city of the, will fund pro bono legal services for people so they can navigate this process. I mean, it's a, it should, it's a pretty basic thing um, that I think will ensure that 
social equity actually uh, occurs. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know it's definitely cost prohibitive a lot of times to be approaching this without any technical or like skills coming into the process. So I, I'm sure it's really daunting for a lot of the applicants to come in and be like, what is this paperwork and, you know, and how do I do it if you they didn't get like a law degree or some type of, you know, like even degrees. I mean, it, there's so, uh, such a variety of applicants out there. So, so the next set of questions that we have, um, are for Erica and Eli, just kind of on policy stuff that we wanted to go over, and just we had questions from the, some of the attendees and that we curated and, and stuff. So for Erica, as we all know, applications for CARD just closed. At the beginning of this year, we were told that there would be stores open by fall 2022. Any guesses, speculation as to how long all this might take, and from what you've seen in the GR world, is this normal to have delays like the ones we've seen in New York? So fall 2022 is today. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, I think listening to OCM representatives, Chris Alexander and others over many, many months, they have all made it very clear they want to get this right. And while they have given timelines and goals, even the governor as early as a couple of days ago doubled down on the, go the goals to get something open this year, he's also made it clear he wants to get it right. So, so if, if, if it happens this year, I think that would be great, but we are prepared for openings to spill over into 2022, into, into 2023, I think that's okay too. You know, regulations take time. They want to really make sure that the MRTA that legalized the, the themes behind it are adhered to, and they, they definitely want to get it right, and they want to make sure these stores are open up with the best success rates as possible. So I'm still holding out for some sales this year, but I do believe that the vast majority of them will probably begin next year. So would love to hear your thoughts. No, I mean, that, that's the, I've heard the same thing from the same people. So maybe one will open and sell one thing this year, but I think the vast majority will open next year. I, and I'm kind of confused as to why it's even rushed to this extent. It seems kind of like political, if, but, um, I think you're going to see most of the dispensaries open next year. And to answer your second question, unless it's like outlined in statute, delays are very, very normal. This is not a New York specific thing. It's not even a state thing. Look at the federal government. Like <laughs> delays are normal. Just know that as long as you guys are getting it right, that's the goal. Thank you. We've seen over the past few months OCM putting a lot of care into preparing card applicants um, for what to expect, holding webinars, video tutorials, um, Chris Alexander, government officials showing their face at events all, all around New York. How is the level of participation and dialogue in New York from regulators like Chris and the OCM and other government officials with the same different? And what have you seen in other states as it pertains to social equity licensing and preparing for adult use can and dispensary licenses? 10 out of 10. <laughs> the um, So Dutchy operates in every single legal market, medical and rec, which for guys keeping up, that's 19 states on the rec side, 38 states on the medical side. There are regulators that will not return emails, calls, we have no idea what's going on. There are whole departments of health that are not even staffed. Um, so the fact that Chris Alexander and his other colleagues have literally been all through the state, I have seen him in so many cities, he's probably sick of seeing me, but it's just so exciting how accessible they've been online, um, in person, on social media, which is how many of us consume information. It really has been impressive and it really does, again, underscore getting it right. So I would give him a 10. Yeah, I mean, like with, with anything else, I'm, I'm hopeful that... When I first met Chris, it was at a conference room at the Drug Policy Alliance in 2018 when he was leading the Start Smart campaign, which is the campaign that eventually legalized cannabis in the state. So this is somebody who comes from caring about equity and comes from caring about justice. So um, I believe that they want to do the right thing up there. I can't compare it to other states because that's just not, I'm only here. Um, but. I think they're trying. They, they would answer. We would email them all the time, and they would show up on their FAQs the next day. But you know, they can't do everything. Like, so, there's some one-on-one -on -one things that people need to go through this process, and that's OCM's not going to be able to handle all of that. When it when it came to the application, um, like the guy said, it kept refreshing. Uh, Cos, he said it kept refreshing. Things kept going off. I had an issue too. I had a glitch where. Um, 
I couldn't even get my application. I couldn't even find it at one point in time. And um, the OCM, the people at the OCM helped me out a lot. I mean, I called in. Uh, the guy told me, he said, he said, Omari, it's only two of us in here right now. And he said, it's, we're working, we're trying to get it done for you. He said, just email me and I'm gonna email you right back. But I thought he was lying. And he literally emailed me right back. And I mean, every time I needed something, like this whole process, it was through email, it was perfect. It was like I was talking to my friend. It was, it was really good, I had a really good experience with it. Can't, can't. That's amazing, that's great. So how long do you think that um, will take OCM to vet all 900 o uh, card applicants at this point? Yeah. <laughs> with only two people. <laughs> They, uh, they said 30 days, and I think it might, like, go in stages, as I understand it. Like, certain regions, maybe there's four dispensaries and only 10 people applied in those regions. Maybe they'll notify those people first. Um, you know, I expect the city, it's more competitive, so it may take a little bit longer. But I think 30 days is what I've, what I've heard, which is, like, what, like 20 days, 30 days from when the, they were submitted. How do you think card applications will be scored? I mean, I think they're going to look at the business experience and grade that on how similar it is to a dispensary. So did you have a brick and mortar store of some kind? Did you interact with the public uh, in some way? Did you have, um, you know, inventory? Um, I, I don't think you, you have to have all those things to get a license, but I think that they're going to grade it higher if your business experience is similar to you know what what a dispensary is. I think they'll look at convictions, where you were convicted, um, you know, maybe even the amount of, of convictions that you have, how impacted you were, if it was you who got convicted, or your you know or your parents or your uh, your children. Um, but beyond that, you know, it was a pretty bare bones application. It's not like there was a lot of places to put in your personal experience. You could try to work it in in some different ways. Um, I don't know if people have other thoughts. What was the question again? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, based off of, I mean, I feel, you know, in, in our city, OCM is traveling around speaking to legacy and, and they're forming alliance, you know, alliances with legacy. So, you know, the, I feel that they're gonna be grading business experience as well. Um, you know, have they operated in the, the legacy market and for how long, um, you know, Obviously, their their charge, um, you know, was it a qualifying charge at like their parents, their brother, their uncle, um, you know, and I mean, that's pretty much you know my thoughts. We just have two more questions, and then we can open up for Q and A, just short Q and A, and then we can have enjoy our food and hang out. Um, so. Um, have you heard anything regarding card applicants having to use a site given to them by DASNY? What if they do not get assigned a location that's near their residence, for example, a few hours away? So if that, is that a concern? Um, so we've been working with DASNY pretty, pretty closely. It's my understanding that people will be able to opt out if they do have their own real estate and their own locations, but I think it's still being fleshed out, TBD. We should be hearing, hopefully in the next few weeks, some of the award winners for the real estate side of things who are doing the design of the physical stores. And I think from there, we'll have a little bit more guidance, but open the you. I don't have anything to add. That's it. <laughs> okay, last question. Um, when do you expect MSOs to come in? <laughs> Any, anybody on that? <laughs> um, gosh, such a good question. Um, I do think that the card qualifying applicants will absolutely have first dibs in the market and the first sales. And I do ex anticipate that MSOs will probably follow closely behind if they want to just keep up with the inventory and, and what's been grown. Um, but I do think that the spirit of the MRTA will be upheld and they will be later on in the process. I, I guess a comment, how, how would it work if, let's just say for example, let's say I pick uh, what region? Uh, the same region, Bro Brooklyn, right? And he lives in Brooklyn. He's from there, but I'm from, you know, Rochester. Uh, you know, will OCM say, well, you know what? You don't qualify. Actually, Hiram does. You know what I'm saying? You know, like, 
yeah, just based on the read. I mean, uh, the fact that he lives in Brooklyn should have. Uh, well, I, I get it. Yeah, but but right, right. But the fact that I live in that region does that give me points? That's I guess that's the question. You know? I don't know if that's necessarily spelled out, but I, I'm just speculating. Like, if you have an arrest and a long-term connection to a region that you prioritize, I, I can't see that not being relevant. Yeah, and, and I think it's right. It, it, it probably should be. I think there will be enough qualified candidates upstate and downstate that there will be no need to move us that far of a distance. I think there will be enough of a pool. I mean, we're at 903. So I think we'll be all set. All right, guys. Um, any other relevant information you think you can let everybody know? Or you guys are you good? <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions? Any Q&A? Any? Yeah, okay. I mean, the one thing I want to say is that, like, I, I think there's sometimes, like, a misconception that this was the license for, like, legacy. Um, because, like, while I do think they want legacy involved with card, like many people in the legacy market don't have tax returns. Like that wasn't going to be a qualifying business under this. I think that in future rounds of licensing, and I hope that legacy will be prioritized and that this isn't the only opportunity. Um, but I, I think that a lot of people feel like, damn, I missed out on this. I'm not going to have an opportunity to participate in the future. Obviously, this is the head start. This is a huge advantage, but it's not the end of, of the game. It's 150 licenses out of, you know, maybe there'll be 1,000 in the state. I don't want it to be confused. I was legacy. 2014 is when, when I actually exit, exited. So for me, having the ability to create something and transition into the legal market, you know, out and, and be card is amazing. And then having the ability to help legacy transition if I give, if, if I'm given the opportunity. And I, and I really think that's what um, OCM wants to push is bringing these experienced legacy growers who are amazing at what they do. When I tell you it's craft cannabis, it's craft cannabis and have them come legal. Therefore, it helps build our ecosystem and this industry. I think really that's the end goal, not just for CARD. So does anybody else have any other questions? Any questions? All right, awesome. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, and thank you for the panelists for traveling so far away. We really appreciate you participating. I know you took your free time out to come down here and to join us. Took a flight here. Flight here. Everyone's flying in. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people that want to get into the, a lot of people from like neighborhood, you know, from the hood. They want to get into the cannabis industry. I think if you have a brand um, and you know how to market yourself and advertise. Uh, you should try to do that now. If you have a brand and you want to get that out there, because there are people like us that are getting, that are trying to get their app, I mean, their license, then they will get it, and that can um, help you get your brand possibly into that dispensary or tell you the process to do so. So if you have a brand, a cannabis brand, you're growing edibles or something like, I mean, making edibles. I don't know what you're doing, selling T-shirts, but um, you should try to get that brand out there, you know, in a legal way. Yeah. <laughs> He just made me think, my advice to anybody getting in any facet of this cannabis space, I, I can appreciate and respect the brand, but it's build relationships. Come to things like this with Canny, get to know people. That's probably been the most rewarding part and what's going to help you the most is by showing up and become a member. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, so like, like they said, the, the, the resources that they provided us just by joining you know, saved a lot of money on one end. I think that the, the $500 really made it well worth it where you, you really become immersed and you have a voice. Like, I help with some white papers. I help the things because I'm helping the regulations. I'm not, I'm very new to this, but still I have a voice and I think that was really important to join the association for that reason. So, thank you everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you Anne and Dutchie and Erica for coming in. Appreciate it.